Hello, hello again. We are live in the Mental and Coach Translators Facebook group on the YouTube channel and my Facebook public page. Welcome to another Ask Your Mentor Anything live. And we have together again Ellen Singer. You know Ellen. She was previously again with us and also is a very active uh, member in many Facebook groups and also a conference speaker um, and many forums. So um, welcome, Ellen. Thank you for accepting my invitation once again. How are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we have a great topic that I got so many messages about it. Like they told me they, they were looking for such a topic online and then uh, we promoted the event and they said, okay, that is the right timing. <laughs> um, so guys, if you have any questions for our today's topic or Ellen specifically, the business side of translation or our topic, um, please use uh, the comments below this video and we will see them and answer them during the live we will try to address all of your questions uh, and if you come up with any more questions during the live we would be happily to answer in the meantime let us know can you hear us well is the sound okay is the picture okay and uh, where are you watching us from i would love to know um since we have like almost 300 new members in the group before we start with our topic I would love uh, to introduce you very shortly this initiative. Uh, we started last January, so we are closing one year this month. We just closed one year. And we are broadcasting live uh, almost every Friday in the group, uh, covering different topics with um, other fellow uh, translators, uh, linguists, interpreters from all over the world. And mostly the topics are related to the business side of our profession, uh, productivity issues that we deal, other than the actual translation part. So if you have any topics that you would really like to cover, and if you have any speaker guests that you would like me to invite, please use the, the form that uh, uh, it, is, it exists in the description box of this uh, live and include the name of the speaker or the topic that you would like us to cover. Hello, Dorota. Uh, she says hello from Poland. Yes, I can hear and see you well. Great. So there is a bit of delay, but thank you for joining us. Um, so this is about business side of translation, productivity, tech issues. And uh, if you have any more ideas that you would like to cover, let us know. We're broadcasting every Friday and maybe we can uh, come up with more ideas. Um, so Ellen is a very well-known person in our profession. If you haven't had the name of Ellen, maybe you could uh, look on Google since it's our topic today. <laughs> um, Ellen, you would like to say a few words. Why did you choose the topic? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm Ellen. I've been in this business for 25 years. For those who don't know me, I um, started out on uh, machines before we even had the what is now called the internet, when we still was only universities settled. I, I love computers. I hate all the algorithms people are in putting on it because I see them all as make it more difficult instead of easier, but because it's for people who don't use computers much, it seems to be useful to many. And that's at least my opinion. And why I use, uh, I, th I believe that we can all increase our productivity and our quality by knowing how to search because we are hampered by the algorithms that Google or other search engines impose upon on us. Google is the worst, but it's also the one that has the most uh, um, users, which also means it has the most usability. Uh, but on the other hand, it's quite irritating that they actually uh, do not allow us to influence it. Um, there are ways to go around the algorithms. Uh, there are ways to do searches that will make it easier and better and uh, on the other hand you have to know them lots of people do not make use I've heard of too many people who don't know how to search they ask for a word or a term on the in the groups and if they would know how to use it they don't have to ask for help every time they can actually just do it themselves because very often it's a one minute search and it's such a pity uh, you are wasting time, you're waiting your colleagues' time. It's not necessary. So I believe in sharing knowledge that will help you move further and need less help. That's what I like doing. So very often I don't only give you the answer when, pe when people do ask things, but I also explain what I did so that they could copy it next time. For me, that is uh, uh, a no-brainer. If we all know how to do things better, it's easier for all of us. 
So that's basically why I do this topic. <laughs> yeah, but I really love when, as soon as you suggested this, some topics, I really love this one because I think, um, I don't know if you've seen that in your career, but I've been asked by several clients of mine if I know actually to set online. So I think some recruiters or um, LSPs owners, they really look for such, uh, can we call it, uh, I don't know, soft skill or hard skill? to know how to search online. So there are including some requirements for a job, especially when it's a terminology based building. And uh, I, I used to consider myself really good at this. And actually I had really good results when we build, for example, a terminology based for financial terms. But I, I really love to know more because I'm doing it how we say on my own. I've never been trained on that. So I would love to know more in a structured way, the way that you're going to do this together with us. Elena says, and uh, nice to see you too, Elena from Italy. So, Ellen. <laughs> the stage is yours. Okay, I'll just uh, uh, say a few things. You can do your words, your searches in Google with words or uh, words and operators, um, with word-based image searches, and you can do it with word combination-based searches, so reference website. So I'll. It's, those are the uh, the four main uh, the four, yeah the four main things I would like to talk about. First of all, what is an operator? Because of course we know an operator as being someone who operates a forklift truck. We're not talking about those. Um, can you put the screen on Virginia? Cause that's what I'm going to do now. You can either use the advanced search, but then you have boxes to fiddle with. I absolutely totally hate forms because I have to look them up. Another option is just use it in your Google search. And then you can use the operators which are on the left-hand side of the uh, slide. And that is things like I can say site and I can tell it to look at only sites with co UK, okay. which means that it'll look in only in Britain, not America, not in Holland, in, in English or anything else. Of course, the algorithms are now such that they still want you to do it. And they have put a lot of co UK things into things that are not in English. So you still sometimes need to uh, set it for the language itself. You can use the and signs. What does an and sign do? Uh, if you say, I want to look for word A, and you put the and sign and word B, it will only look for both words. I don't know how irritated you get, but when I put five words in, it tells me, oh, here are the hits, and we forgot about this word, and we forgot about that word. Want to avoid that? Put the and sign in between them, okay. and it'll all come up, and it will ignore the sites that don't have all those words in it. So then you're making sure you get the next filter level without having to go through it. So if I'm looking for uh, a car uh, part, I can put car and whatever. And if the word car is not also on the website, it won't appear. Uh, nowadays, I have I am very, very angry with, with the whole algorithm they want us to go to instagram 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 i hate it don't force me to go anywhere so <laughs> i put minus instagram if i put minus instagram it doesn't show me the instagram hits i got rid of all of them in one go and that would be to... really helpful for pinterest for example when you search pinterest, for instagram it doesn't matter which one exactly. whatever you don't want to have sometimes you have um dictionaries that keep on uh popping up because they've paid to be up Mm -hmm. but they're absolutely worthless they're actually mm -hmm. stupid dictionaries mm -hmm. um but they're paid so they're always up there and then everyone thinks they're useful just put minus or block the site or you put minus and you then don't have them uh, you can use placeholders which is an asterisk you can use at twitter or at whatever if you want to find out more about a certain company or a certain something or a hashtag you can put all of those and you can also use or this word or that word and then it doesn't have to look for both sometimes that's useful usually it isn't if you don't like using all these operators because you can't remember them all i mean if i do site code uk it works perfectly but if i do um something else it might not uh if you don't like that then use the far the advanced search uh option 
if you can't see it, it used to be very easy to click on that van search on the search window. Nowadays, they hide it. It's somewhere at the bottom and it's hidden. Just Google advanced search Google and you'll get it in one go and it will be easy to fill in the form instead of using all the operators. The other day, for me, it was really funny because just two days ago, we had a discussion in a group in uh, a Dutch group. Um, that Dutch group, someone said, I am looking for parking, but only in French. So the word parking, as it is used in French, but not in just French, in France. Uh, in a French context. Yes, okay. in the French language. Uh, but not only just France, and all the world over. So I, sh I told her, go look here uh, in the advanced search. Then I went to the advanced search and put in, and I put the language on French. And immediately, I only had French things, because she had tried with dot fr but then she also had to do dot uh, canada and a few other countries and it was becoming very very um complicated hard to filter it <laughs> and i said well all you have to do is set your advanced search in into french only and then bob's your uncle and so she 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 was totally surprised that this worked so quickly i just sent her the link it took me two seconds and she was really happy and I think it's very important to know about these things because sometimes you just need them. Can you repeat the example you mentioned? Like what did the lady in this that case it was parking, but only in French. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was the solution in it? Oh, the advanced, the advanced search. I just put. I I went to the advanced search option for Google. Mm -hmm. I put the parking in the word part, mm -hmm. and I put uh, French language. You can, uh, as you can see, the first one here to narrow your results. Uh, is uh, language, and you can put French. Amazing. That's it. Yeah, that's so simple. And then and you don't have all the other stuff that is in the way. It's so simple, and we don't use element. Uh, the, the word operator that you use is the official term that uh, we use. Uh, yes. And um, what is the connection with Boolean? Have you? Uh, do you know the Boolean uh, sets uh, on LinkedIn? Boolean. No, I don't because I don't know LinkedIn. I really? don't really like it because they want you to pay. I am I, <laughs> against most uh, media. I am have a free one. And they keep on telling me every single day, you can do a free course. You can come and do this for a month free. And then you have to pay. Well, no, that's not me. What I'm teaching on LinkedIn is both for the free version and the paid version. So you can totally implement what I'm telling in the free version. But it looks like what you're telling us here a bit with the Boolean sets method where you can actually exclude some terms or you can actually narrow down the results that you want. So. Okay, so let's continue. 20 years ago, I was translating software that made sure that you had uh, lists of terminology that you did want and didn't want in text you were writing. It was mm -hmm. software specifically for writing. So if you wrote one of the wrong ones, it would tell you, ah, ah don't, etc. And it's the same principle. It's all the same principle. It's not as if they're brilliant new ideas. This has been around for 20 years. So it's basically the same idea. Um, shall we just stop sharing this one? Yep. Um, years ago, I had a colleague, uh, she, she works for us, and she was looking for a specific term for a traffic light. But not just any traffic light, only one that went up from one side over the road, but didn't go down again. And because I knew she had done all the logical searches, I, she had done, spent an hour on it and hadn't found the term, I didn't do what was logical, I just went and looked for all sorts of images of traffic lights. And every time it was the right one, I would click on it and see if there was a term. After about five clicks, I had a term, and then I looked for that term, and I had it. So within five or 10 minutes, I had found the term that had taken her an hour to look for. And she was angry for it herself, because she said, what happened? I said, well, I normally would have done the whole hour first myself, but I know you know how to do that. So I went to where I wouldn't go normally, only as a last resort, and it worked. And sometimes you can just do that. You can go if you want to know a term of a, uh, I don't know, of a, of a machine, a specific sort of machine, you put the machine in and then you start looking for pages to see if there are part lists or whatever. That's also an option. That's what you can do with uh, image uh, searches. Um, I recently had to do a whole Webs, uh, a whole uh, course on flanges for flange 
uh, installers and flange people. So people who only work with flanges. So you can't call them just a flange. You have to specify each sort. And in Dutch, we had something called a steak flens. And it means it looks like a bedpan. So that's why it's called steak, because a steak, uh, something is, is, is the bedpan in the old days when you were uh, bedridden and you had to go to the toilet. So I was looking for something like that and I couldn't find it. So in the end, what I did was I just went on and I, uh, because the lingue options and the other options everywhere online, they were all sort of other things. But if you then look for that in the images, you don't find one with a handle. And I wanted one with a handle. So you had to, it, it told me it was a blind flange. It told me it was a blanking flange. It was told me it was a flange, a connecting flange. But in this case, I couldn't use that. I had to use a specific term. So I did all sorts of uh, different uh, flange searches until I found them. And it turned out being not the connecting flange because that was wrong again, but something called a spade. So who would go from bed pan flange to think it's called a spade? It's called a spade or a ring spacer. Fine. But okay. I wouldn't have found that without image searches. Image searches. So you mentioned before that you were going to cover four elements. Yes, we're and, in three now. Okay, the first one was operators. So the second one was... Wait, the first one was uh, just words. Okay. Just words. And the, and the, the words second one and is... Operators. Mm -hmm. And then you have the word-based image search. Mm -hmm. And the last one is the word combination-based search. OK, because I like to sum up and people also to follow us. So we've already covered how, what are the operators and how to use them in order to find a specific term for a specific language or a location, so on. The second uh, element that already Ellen mentioned and covered is the simple words search. This, the third one about uh, how to combine images, searches, and to find better results. And now we are in the word combination you mentioned. Yes. Uh, sometimes you have um, a problem. Mm -hmm. And you want to find things like, for example, car parts and screws. And then you, or, or, or screws or whatever, but then you use that word first, and then you use other words to find what it is, to limit it. Because if you just use the second term only, you will get a lot of other hits that you don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, so and you can use the image search to combine it with that. But what I very often do when it's a topic, I'm not 100% up to date in or 100% sure of, or it's a very, very small niche thing that you don't have specialized translators in. I'm a technical translator. I very often first start by going to websites talking about the subject. Mm -hmm. I put in two, three, four terms. I go there. I read everything about it. I know what it does. And then I try and find a similar website in the other language. Exactly. Read that. And after I've done both, they don't have to be the same page. They don't have to be a translation of each other. They just have to give me information on what it is. If a whole translation is about this one little part in this one little car and this one little thingy, I need to know what does it do and how does it work? Because and if I not, I can't translate it. Yeah, I don't know if you agree, Ellen, but most of us, we make this mistake. We start with the bilingual sets uh, instead of going yeah. to one language sets, which gives us a lot of a lot more results. Uh, when we're I looking think that lately, two or three quarters of what I find online bilingual is wrong. Just like I showed with the flange, everything was calling it a flange and a blank flange and a this flange and a that flange when it's not even called a bloody flange. <laughs> it is a flange, but it's not called a flange. It was a bad translation, you mean? So they had so the they were all bad translations. They should have been called spades. Okay. And or a spade a uh, ring spacer, but not a flange or any version of a flange. It took me a while to find that. But I found it. And because I was translating a PowerPoint specifically to give a course on flanges, you can't have a generic word for it. You have to specify each and every flange. So for that translation, I learned 20, 30 different types of flanges. Amazing, amazing. Normally, you don't need that. But you have to be able to narrow it down with good searches 
to know that you're using the right one. And only when you put the right term in and all the, well, half the images give you exactly what you wanted, that is when you can stop. For me, in technical uh, translations, it really helps. I don't know if it's the same with uh, other niches, for example. But I know for medical and technical translations, really, the images really help, okay? As, uh, as long as you find uh, good examples and good translations and good sources, reliable sources. Hello, Kenneth. I see some people, they send me messages that they, they don't see us live. So you need to refresh your page. If you see the reminder that we are going live, maybe you need to refresh your page so as to show you that we are live because we are already with Ellen live 20 minutes. So as Kenneth had this problem, please refresh your page if you're still seeing the same message so as to show up, okay, the actual live. So welcome, Kenneth, as well. If you have any questions, we would love to address them. Um, so, Ellen, you were about to add something, or we can continue with some specific... No, no, go. You, uh, you just said something, which I was was my next idea to talk <laughs> okay. about, and uh, that's the weight of your reference material. Uh -huh. if, you, okay. if you have the Urlex and it tells you it's the right term, mm -hmm. it's the right term. If it's okay. a specific... Uh, I, I very often use the example of the train dictionary. There's a train dictionary for five languages, European languages. Even if it's called a switch in English, and it's not a switch, it's still a bloody switch. And you have to remember that. It's whatever the first people called it and it started to become used, that's what you're using. There are a lot of terms that don't make sense. They're called switches and they're not. They're called whatever and they're not. That doesn't mean that that is not the term every single engineer or whatever is going to be uh, aware of. So we don't have to tell them, it's not a switch, it just is. But you have to have weighted reference material to make this assumption. So Urlex works, Wikipedia works, uh, specific works. Can I show the slide? Can I show the slide? Okay. Sure. Yes. I have slides for this because I have already used it before, but I made it for... So those this. are, uh, as we can say, reliable... Uh... The left is reliable, but blogs don't have to be reliable. Mm -hmm. Unknown entities don't have to be reliable. Lingue doesn't have to be reliable. Lingue exactly. is just a compilation of bilingual websites and stuff and translations. So it is. it has a lot of very useful things, but you have to check whether it's actually used. As I said before, in Lingue, the five translations for the flange all had the word flange in it when it shouldn't have. Um, the Eurodicotom, you have it in the Eurelex. Eurelex, Eurodicotom. Eurodicotom. Eurelex is for like, for, more for legal things. But yeah, yes, I know, I right. know, I know, but I don't see Eurodicotom because if we do financial or a legal or EU tax, Eurodicotom is really. I useful. didn't want to put all of them. I was just making an example of a few sites that are waiting. That but are okay. Not, yeah, even though it's an EU instrument, it's not always 100% reliable sometimes. No, so you nothing need to is. Check and double check, even though they are uh, uh, EU instruments like yes. Europe and so on. So you need yes. to double check the results anytime. But lots of people don't know about, um, the, uh, look, don't look up things. So, uh, for example, uh, in English, it's the machinery directive. Mm -hmm. In Dutch, it's five words. Okay. But lots of people then call it the machine directive in Dutch. That's wrong. You have to use the whole thing, etc. I don't know if it still is that because I haven't done much with that yet lately, but it happens. And sometimes they change it and they decide that they will call it differently next time. And then you have to know about this. You have to know what is used today, not what was used five years ago and is still in your memory. You have to double check that the directives still exist, that the directives are still there and what they are called. And sometimes you have it in so certain languages. It is 10 words and it's only one in another so you have to look this up and you have to look up all sorts of entities all the time i'll give another example of a change that we have found 25 years ago we had everything was project um oriented in england and pro sorry in america and pro uh, project orientated in uh england i don't know if it was to avoid this difference between the two but nowadays it's project focused you have to know this. You have to, even if your old memories give you oriented or orientated, you nowadays use focused. And you have a lot of such terms. So make sure to do your searches, even if you think you know the terms. 
That's one of the things that lots of people don't do. 20 years ago, it was this. So now I still use that. No, you have to check because do things do change. I, I really love those small small tips that you add at the end. And if we can sum up all of them in the end, because they're, I think those are really, really useful and we, need, we tend to neglect, for example, the fact that you mentioned earlier, uh, in one language sets instead of bilingual sets of a term. And uh, also now that you mentioned this one, so if you have more of these, we can sum up uh, before we end this slide so as people to make notes. Yeah, you, you do that. I, I'll, I'll forget to do them. I don't think okay. there is. Yeah, I, I forget. Okay, I will write I down. Talk. I just okay. talk. I'm okay, sorry. I need to write down then. So one was not the bilingual, okay, sets. Sometimes the just read the, 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 because that has been written actually in that language. The other one is the translation. A translation isn't always visible as a translation, but it does influence the translation. Mm -hmm. So if you have something written, I once did a translation uh, on, ho and I needed a term for a horse fence, a specific horse fence. I didn't know anything about it. So I and Googled, and Googled, couldn't come out, I couldn't find what I needed. I called the guy. I called a guy who built horse fences. <laughs> and I just, you know, called him and said, listen, I need this term and it has to have four, three layers, not two or whatever. And he said, oh, that's called that. I said, okay, thank you. And then I Googled it and it was right. But I hadn't found it myself. And sometimes that's a good tip too. Just call people. Everyone loves talking about their business. I think that's the advice that you can give. And it was one advice we were given when I was a student at the university from our professors. What is the best tool for a translator? Is their agenda of people they know in specific uh, industries and professions. So if you have a medical term, ask your doctor or the friend, the friend that is a doctor. Or if you have a tech term or a legal term, ask the lawyer that you know in your agenda. So that's a great advice. So I'm writing down also this one. I have uh, a what, uh, my reviewer for Spanish. Uh, she always tells me, oh, I'm not sure about this term. I'm checking it out with my building guy or I'm checking it out with my, <laughs> mm, my I'm checking out with this and that. And it's lot, I love the fact that she has always got friends that do something that is related to that term and she finds it out. And she says, oh. You can find if you don't have any friend, you can ask for such an acquaintance. Yeah, uh, you of course can you say. can. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can um, do this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to talk about is typos. Google has decided for us that we are bad typists. We are extremely bad typists. When I write this word, which is a village in Hungary, if I write this in Google, it'll give me not this, but Salford. See, because Salford is a bigger community in England. So it decides that I made a typo, that I didn't mean the O with the umlaut on top, that I didn't mean the L, but typed that wrong, it should have been an R, and I want to know everything about a village in England, which is, of course, ridiculous, but that's because of search frequency. So more people look up Salford than Shalford. So because of that, Google thinks you made a mistake. It's the th most irritating a part of the Google searches nowadays for me, that every time I write an actual term it, and I tell it what to look for, it tells me, oh, you didn't mean that. You're wrong, you didn't mean that. You don't know what you're looking for. I do, well, I, they don't. So I have to tell it, listen, I wanted to give me that. So we have a comment Just from adding Kevin. a point to the thing about searching after specific little nuts. There's a lot of good term and knowledge to make a note form for later use on the way towards the right term. Uh, so don't rush her through it unless you're in a hurry. I totally agree, Kenneth. <laughs> I totally agree. Make time to search your stuff. I've done a, 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 a hundred types of, uh, of roof tiles. I've done a hundred types of plinths. You didn't even know they existed. And uh, you can't always trust the doctor, the lawyer, or whatever. But if you ask two or three, you will get the right results. Of course. So always check the names. That's something I always say, check your names. Use Google to check names. Every single company writes their own company name wrong, writes their own employees' names wrong, writes their own titles for people who are working in the thing. They sort of know, oh, they're from that department. I'll give them a title in the, in the, in the source text. And if you then go to LinkedIn, you'll find that their title is not 
what something, but it's completely something else. And it should reflect each other because that has been impl implemented by the person themselves. If I call myself a gooby cook maker, that's what I should be called and not a translator. Of course, I'm not a gooby cook maker. I am a translator, but you know, if I am calling myself whatever I am calling myself, that's what should be in the document. Um, add your names to the term base. They will be uh, coming up, and then you don't make mistakes when you're typing when you're putting them in there. And um, I once had three people at the office uh, looking what I was doing, and I was trying to explain to them, look up the names. So we looked up three names, and two out of three were wrong. If I then look up three names and two and all three are right, of course, they don't learn what I'm trying to tell them. They think it's useless. But if they actually see that two of the three names in a document from a company are wrong, they start understanding why I want them to Google it. And what so is the best Google way it. to find the reliable one? What is the best way to distinguish? To to do what? Sorry. To find the one that is good enough to distinguish which is the wrong with the Usually, uh, that's what I use Google, LinkedIn for. That's why I also have an account. Uh, and that's why I, I, I'm planning someday to do more with my account, but I haven't yet. But I will soon, I hope, if I have the time. But um, if the person, if you say you are a Greek, you are a translator, fine. I call myself the hugging translator, right? So okay. my profile says I'm the hugging translator. Mm -hmm. So if you Google me and it says I am the embracing translator in the source text, you have to change that into the hugging translator. Yes? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So yeah, even though it's a, it's a synonym, if that's not what you call yourself, that's not what's right. Uh, lots of names are wrong. You have a lot of names that are uh, that have the double S, the single S, the whatever, or just uh, special um, uh, 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 diacritics on them. Look them up, because very often in the source deck, they have removed all the diacritics. And you want them in there, your translation, because you want to be correct and not mess about mm -hmm. like the author did. Authors mess about a lot. It's a pity, but they do. They uh, repeat themselves. They make a, a mess of their uh, original text. That uh, usually what it really helps is to ask your client for reliable sources that you should look for. So they take that on their own, or you write down the the sources that you found, the terms. If you of course think that those sources are reliable, and you have them okay as reference to your client whenever something comes up, which. We are humans, uh, especially about names and titles of people. You can find several of them online, so you can write down the most reliable uh, resource that you think of, and uh, then you can have proof to your client, like, I find I found there. But unless they have told you beforehand that you need to, uh, for example, use this specific um, resource. Yep, so. That's fine. But what I also do is what you say, writing down, that's great, but I will have forgotten where I wrote it down. And yes, I can have it in reference. But then it, as, as I get more projects from the same client, I might forget I have been building this. So what I do is I write that in the comments file in my uh, cat tool. I put the link to the right. LinkedIn address or I put the link into whatever. And uh, it's up to them to change it in the source or not. Of course. But in the, I explain why I use this in the translation. Definitely. More often than not, they change the source. Very yeah. often they change the source. Yeah. But, uh, but, but that's up to them. That's not my yeah. problem. Yeah. And also about the client, you can do it on a Katsu, as Ellen says. If you can have a file for the client, I have an online doc that I have all the resources per, per project. So it depends on you and your organization, productivity tool, if you use any yep. project management tool. So it's up to you where you're Whatever going. works for you. Those for no. me, it works this way because then I am sure I am telling the customer because yeah. with every single project, I send them the bilingual uh, file. Even to direct client? I the direct clients, everyone. No, no, Why? They can that. see it in combo. In the old days, what I did was I wrote, this is what you had, this is what I think it should be, that's why my translation is this. But that <laughs> takes a lot of time. 
Exactly. An effort every time after a big project that was, you know, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, putting all these in a way that they would understand, and then they would come back. And where is that? In which file? Where is it? <laughs> and then I'd have to explain it again, which I had already done. The other day I had it. I sent them the bilingual, it's all there. And I said, there are two comments in the file. Please look at them because I think they're mistakes in your source text. You only have two because you've done a good job. And she says, oh, I only saw one. I said, oh, so I copy and paste the two little bits from the bilingual back into the message and I send it back because there are, you know, you want to be nice, but you know, you don't want to waste time all the time doing this. So you, I send the bilingual and then it's up to them to sort it out, not me. I told them your source stinks. You want to do something about it? Fine, do it. You know why, yeah, why I love those lives that we do? Because we all of us deal with similar problems. And it's really nice to hear that from another colleague, from another country that works in a different uh, country, different uh, industry with different lights. But we all of us somehow we have dealt or we will deal with such issues. Oh, yes, we will. And it's really, really helpful what you've been sharing with us, Ellen, because it's something really practical that we might see in our profession. I'm going to see the next slide because I can't yep. remember what comes next. Let's go. Eh? Why doesn't it do anything? Um, we have more or less 20 minutes. So if you can include go. the most important. This will be a quick one, a very quick one. Okay. Uh, different languages for uh, uh, Niger. In Dutch, uh, you would expect that the Dutch Republic Niger would be the Republic of Niger, but it is of the Niger even though it, then in Portuguese, it doesn't have the the, but it does in English. So you have to look them up. You can't just let them go. I don't know the official name of a country I'm not totally familiar with. So I look them up and Wikipedia is a good way of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, Google yourself once in a while for the fun of it. And if you need to narrow it down, if you have a very, um, a specific name like Virginia, so it'll be probably only her. Um, there are three other Ellen singers in the world uh, that are pretty much on the internet. Yeah, I'm like so I have to narrow it down. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> if I do just my name, I get lots of other people in it, as you can see. But if I Google myself and put translator, I mainly get me. Interesting. So this is the difference between, and as you see, I put the inverted uh, quotes there, the quotes on the top. I don't want all the Ellen's because if not, I get, of course, a lot of the Ellen who uh, has this series on 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 uh, on the TV. I don't want her. I don't want anyone else. I want all the Ellen singers. But there is a veterinarian in the US and there are other people. Some of them are actually their real names. Some are pen names. I don't care. But I don't want this to come up. I want this to come up. So the way to show how to do it is I do the quoted Ellen Singer and I put translator. And just like that, most of them are mine. I mean, this one here isn't the, the one with the, uh, that is from the, I think, the veterinarian. And then we have one picture of Alessandra because uh, I am part of All Round trans, uh, Translators. And then at the third line, it starts moving further along. And can well, I mention something? If I do the same research for my own Google based in Greece, for example, have, having different cookies of yours might most probably have different results, similar yes. but different. So it always plays a role where you are located, what are the cookies, what is the history of your searches, the location, and so on. So definitely helps. And other people's searches, not just your searches, also other people's searches. Yeah. They, make, they influence your results as well. So anyway. Uh, I had a fun thing last time with East Africa. I really like this fact. What is East Africa? Because I went to the East Africa conference. And uh, it's really funny because here we have that it was used to be three names and then it was included some more uh, countries. And then we go into uh, here that it's 20 territories. And then you move to another language. And in Spanish, it says it is 18 countries. So you have to be aware of these differences. So if you heard thing says that 18, the 19, the 20 countries of East Africa, you have to Google it and you actually have to translate it with the 18 countries. Or you have to make a note that it's different for the two. You cannot just say the 20 countries because then they go to, to, to Wikipedia and they find out it's 18 and they think you made a mistake. 
It depends on the context of your yeah. translation. Yeah. But use your brain. Not every single uh, term can be put from A to B. You have to think of the context in which you're putting it. Yeah. In this I case, think that, uh, Wikipedia is a reliable source or resource for our translation in general. And most of the times I get rejected if I support any of my findings based on Wikipedia. I think it is an extremely reliable one. Um, they have done research to see in how much how reliable Wikipedia is, and um, they compared it to the reliability of the Encyclopedia Britannica in the old days. It's more reliable than the Encyclopedia Britannica. Maybe it has to do with also the language combination. Maybe because maybe. here in Greece, it's not accepted as a reliable source. And some and connections are wrong. Some connections are wrong. Yeah. Sometimes when you go from one language to the other, you get in the wrong page mm -hmm. because someone made the link and no one realized that it was wrong. But of course, you have to, as always, use your brain. Your main asset as a translator is your own brain. Use it always. So in this case, what I'm saying is, the term in Spanish and in English is completely different. And if I then go to Portuguese, it will tell me that there is a different list of, land, of countries that is part of uh, uh, East Africa, yeah. which I think it's really interesting that there it's all everyone. So if you're talking about this and you're translating about this, if it's relevant, only if it's relevant, you make a little note and you tell the customer that it isn't the same in all the languages. My sister once was doing a translation and she went online and she, it was all about animals. And the author of the text had been a biology uh, uh, guy who knew everything about the animals. And he had used a specific name. And she was correcting it. And she changed all of them. And the guy said, this translator, this editor knows nothing. But my, do my sister then answered back, said, oh, yes, but this, 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 this. And then it, see it turned out that five years before, they had changed the whole nomenclature for this all the names for the all the animals in the animal kingdom they have decided on different names yes i remember style. yeah i remember that example i've, I've heard that from you again i cannot recall. probably it's but really i think that's beautiful a biology guy bio, a biologist didn't know that it had changed and once he knew he realized that my sister was right and not him he was extremely happy with her so sometimes telling them off actually makes them happy. And it is a way of getting yourself uh, customers and keeping them. And also we come back with the previous example that you need to keep your resources where you found your terms in order to use them in such examples that already uh, yes. elevation. And uh, be, uh, regarding the countries that you mentioned, I would go to the United Nations website or a more reliable source so as to have That's some... Fine. Yeah. Everywhere there are mistakes. I remember 20 years ago, my neighbor had to look up the Independence Day of uh, uh, one of our older colonies. And there were uh, five different dates in reliable sources online. So you always have to see if it's right. Then can make a mistake. If it's, you know, the second of uh, the, the, the second of a month or the 22nd, then someone might have forgotten to put the second too. Just check it if it exists in more than one website. If it exists in 50 or 300 or 5 million websites, then you're sure it's safe. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, if you're doing an idiom or a quote, don't be lazy. Don't translate it. I saw this one uh, uh, not recently. Someone had translated this one. Uh, no matter how long a tree trunk is in the water, it will never turn into a crocodile. <laughs> but the actual idiom is no matter how long a log stays in the water, it doesn't become a crocodile look it up so what i did i googled uh tree water crocodile and just checked what the most usual term uh string of words is the whole phrase you don't want to translate this you want to have the real one same thing with bible or any other quote and then you stick to one bible for example if you do the king james you do the one king james and all your quotes should come from that single bible not from anyone you find first so those are the you know things that you have to think of that's when you're checking things online um this is a funny one that a translator had this animal in dutch is called a letter setter which translates nicely in english but this is a normal letter setter 
So the guy first thought that it was a mistake because it was all about Beatles, but he was expecting it to be about a printing process. But it wasn't, it was about this little beetle that is called that. But it's only called a letter setter in, in, in English. I mean, in Dutch, not in English. So those things are th things I always try to spot on the internet. And this is the guy who actually was doing that. And he did this in January. I try to keep track of these sort of uh, little uh, things on, on internet in the, in the groups. Uh, this is what I love getting from Facebook groups. This is why I'm so active. <laughs> This was another one, the OPA aluminium foil. Try Googling OPA aluminium foil and you will get a lot of grandparents because OPA in Dutch means grandparent. You will not find any useful links. So what do you do if you want to know what that is in another language? What actually OPA stands for? Advanced. Advanced. Sorry? Advanced, 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 advanced. With the uh, well, I added, me, me, it was all about medication blister packs. It's a new um, aluminium foil that they put. So I added medication blister packs to the search. And then, whoops, I got oriented polyamide film. Or In actually, biaxially oriented polyamide film. It's an nylon film that they use so that the medication doesn't get um, wet and loses its uh, usefulness. So I found this, but I couldn't have found this just looking for OPA. I needed the medication blister packs, the context. Context. The context is everything when you're searching. Without that, I would not have gotten anywhere. But then I found this. This was actually a search that um, uh, Marek was doing when for a job when he was staying with me. And so we discussed it and we tried to do our best and then I needed context and then we found the right context and we found it. But first he had been searching himself and we all have to go through this. Even the people who are very uh, good at searching, we sometimes have to go a different route than we usually do. And also you know when this is really, really, really helpful when you actually have a term that has three or four different meanings, like financial terms, when you provide the context, you have more reliable results. So this is also very useful, not only for something that is very difficult to find, but also something that might have five or four different meanings in the same yeah. language. So definitely context will help you to narrow down the right one. So here you find the details of Ellen. So if you would actually would like to continue the discussion, feel free to tag Ellen in the mentoring for translators group or contact Ellen uh, in the means that you see here uh, on the screen. So I will hide the okay. slide, but you can definitely watch the recording and um, to find the details. So Ellen, thank you so much. We are on time to sum up for those that they came late. What you can actually find by watching the recording here, the four ways of searching or elements that Ellen suggests. So you can go back and watch the recording anytime. It will stay in the Mentoring for Translators Facebook group, my Facebook public page and on my YouTube channel. So go back and watch the recording to find out four different ways, okay, to find out a specific term. Also, some great tips that Ellen shows uh, uh, behind the results, the, um, the examples that she provides. So Ellen uh, showed us some great examples of how to look for a term. And uh, additionally, we had some great, great uh, tips and tricks. I have here some notes. I don't know if I cover everything. So for example, it's better to look for monolingual, like in specific language, the term instead of bilingual searches, to call people and have an agenda of people uh, working in a specific industry when you want to have an additional advice or a more reliable, and always ask more than one person. And include the resources. Ellen suggests that you can include them in the capsule so you can have in the file and you can share the bilingual file with you with your client. But in general, you can include it in the comments of your uh, document, docx, or the file that you keep the, the project or the productivity tool, uh, project management tool that you use for your clients. Specific uh, tips on how to look for titles, names, idioms, um, idioms. Idiom. Yeah. Oh, an idiom, not an idiom. It's an idiom. Okay. And slide with uh, the reliable uh, resources. It's really, really important because Ellen distinguishes the difference between reliable resources and some more. Of course, there are more than them. Okay, we actually mentioned some more of those. 
Uh, but you can watch the recording and find more about uh, those tips and tricks. We would love to address your questions. So if you come up later with questions, you can tag Ellen. Or if you watch the recording, uh, you can contact Ellen directly or myself. And of course, uh, you will see the details of the websites of Ellen. So you can contact Ellen directly if you have more things you would like to discuss uh, on this topic. Ellen, thank you so much. Before we close, uh, just to invite you to the free challenge since I'm, I just posted and I have, I don't know, 200 uh, signups already. People are really, really interested and I know Ellen doesn't love it, but I'm running a free challenge on LinkedIn for those that they would like to find how to actually become more visible and how actually to turn it into a lead generation machine, even if the term has been saturated, I really mean it. So people, they have just implemented some, some small changes on their profile. They saw many connection requests of idea clients and their visibility, the number of people visiting their profiles to increase every, every, every day. Um, so if you're interested in doing that with me, we are going to do it February 8th uh, for a week, five days every day together to implement some small changes so to see results and thank you Ellen once again today's topic I find really really interesting Google searches to do it the efficient way go back and watch the recording and see you next Friday Ellen thank you so much is there anything else you would like to add I would just want to know if there are any questions because they usually are and if yeah, Kenneth questions... was really, really interested and I asked him directly if he has any questions and he says that he really found it interesting but he, not for the moment so maybe they just wanted okay. to and the ways of just implement it but usually uh, many members watch the recordings as well so we will see in the group mm -hmm. i would love to see a discussion with the group so if you have questions ellen is available we love questions and this is why we call it ask your mentor and because we really want to address your questions ellen there is a question in the group but i don't know if you've seen it there is a translator member in the group that they would like there is not here in the comments okay they would like to find out if a translation job they have been requested is a scam or not. And he has provided some uh, details on the project. So if we could go and address that question. But definitely having just some parts of emails that you've been sent is really difficult for us to give you advice uh, reliable if it is a scam or not. But we will take a look uh, at your messages in the group. And I don't know, Ellen, if you agree, but in general, if you have a, a feeling that this is a scam, most probably it is. What do you think, Ellen, in general? I think it is. Very often it is. Look at what they want to do. On the other hand, you also have people that are reliable. I mean, imagine if you are in a completely different kind of culture and you're using your normal cultural way of doing things in an international setting, you will mess it up. Yeah. It will look like a scam, but it doesn't have to be. I'll give you a nice example. There was a group of about 30 people who love to invent languages for fun. They had their own group. And suddenly someone entered the group and said, hi, guys, will any of you want to do uh, work on a um, inventing two different languages, completely, totally different ones for a series for television? nine out of ten of the group thought it was a scam one of one of them decided to work on it two three others did too and they applied for this and one of them got the job okay and you so know what the job that was mm -hmm. that was the job of inventing the two languages for game of thrones wow Amazing. since then he is the language inventor for tv in the us he is asked to make the, as, two languages the most di di different as possible or whatever and it wasn't a scam it sounded like a scam but the guy didn't know how to do this so this group thought oh you know what i'll join them and ask them there because it seems to be a group of people who do this so let's just find out if they want to do this and yes he asked the question there and no one thought it was a real thing because why would he enter the group to do this but it was and since then his main job is doing this so in general the job advice, of his dreams so in general your advice would be so it's the name of this translator is Ixha El Salahi so most probably is an Arabian country I'll look, I'll look it up in a moment in the, exactly. in the, in the group and exactly. I'll, I'll address it directly but so you don't know so you can give them the benefit of that I had a, a few weeks ago I had someone say oh I want you to do a translation 
okay? Um, is this right? Yeah, okay. Within five minutes, yes. And then she sent me, I had to do a non-disclosure thing, okay? And then I had to uh, do something else. And then I want, she wanted me to do the first paragraph for free. And then I said, listen, either give me everything now or don't. But I don't feel like working this way. Mm -hmm. Give me all the conditions you want to work in, and I'll tell you I'll work for it. But don't make me do every little step separately, because that's not the way it works for me. I want to know what I'm, I'm getting myself into. So in general, and she never answered again. It was ah, a scam. Okay, so then you, you explained an example, you showed us an example. But in general, if you feel it's a scam, most probably it is, because there are some yes. exceptions. Actually, what I suggest is to ask more information. And of course, it's really difficult, Ellen, for starting out translators to distinguish the thing that you mentioned because you have a way of working already. So you know what you ask for the client. A starting out translator, they don't have a specific way of working, like to ask the, the right questions to the client to figure out. I think so asking is your most yeah. important tool. Your brain to may decide what to ask and what not to ask, and then the questions you said. Because you can very quickly know if it's a real person or not, if they actually want something or not. I've had it that people, I mean, it's been a while and phones are not used that often anymore. But I used to get phone calls from total strangers. I didn't know who they were. Who they were. First of all, do I see their number or not? Exactly. Do I know if I look them up on the internet, if I have a name of the customer and I look it up on the internet, do they exist? And if so, where do they exist? Do they send me this um, this message through, for example, um, a, 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 a free email account? A Gmail? Oh, it's Gmail yeah. If it's a company account, I am. it's more trustworthy than if it's a Gmail or in Hotmail or whatever account. Does the name actually exist on LinkedIn? Do they actually have a profile connected to that company? Because if company, a well-known brand, sends me a message, but the person is not on LinkedIn as part of that company, as a representative, yeah. Yeah, no so way I'm going to accept yeah. that. To sum up, what we look for is a, a professional signature with details of co communication contact details like an email or an address, web address, or maybe their phone number, so as to know that those people, they exist. Then you can look for them online so as to configure if actually they exist. And uh, what I've seen from other translators, and I really find it really clever, and I do when I don't see a professional email address or a web address in their signature, you can have a Google form or a survey form or a form on your website. You, you can actually send to those clients where they include their details, name, surname, contact details, budget for the project, details about the project and the project maybe files themselves. So as to exclude all the other uh, situations, so as at least to decrease the chances of working with a scammer. So that's also a way of working, like ask them oh, before that. Their details. One more thing about it all. We have lots of groups where we talk about these things. We have the speaking dolphins. We have the uh, payment practices. We have yeah. a few others. Uh, we find that some agencies and some groups have come back and back again with the same problem. They yeah. every time don't pay. They sell your translation. They get the money, but then they're gone. They disappear. They go bankrupt. And they restart a company with a very similar name. Yeah. You can find this out and you can talk about it. Ask around. The, the speaking dolphin works that you ask it. You don't get answers there. You get private messages on Facebook because you don't want to have uh, problems with uh, calling someone a bad payer or libel suits or anything else. You have it all hidden. Then you're totally protected. You just ask. Does anyone know this specific company? And it can work for agencies, it can work for direct customers. It can work direct for customers is more difficult because not all of us work with the same direct clients all over the world. Agencies, more or less, yes, we have some experience, all of us. But again, the having the form before starting a project for a direct client to ask them details of the project and their company details, that at least reassure you uh, and have uh, lower chances of working with a scammer in the end. So thank you all of you for being here live. We're almost 
on time, one hour live. Ellen, thank you so much for the advice. I've tagged you in the specific uh, post in the group if you would like to take a look. I've answered to that person, but uh, definitely they need more help on figuring out if it's actual, uh, an actual project. I'm going to or... look at that because it's easier uh, when you're like 25 years exactly, behind you than exactly. when you're just starting out. It just is. Okay. I wish I had, so I had a group of more help when I started out. It's just so much easier now. You know what I get from starting out translators? I get the opposite. Like right now, there are so many resources out there that we are fed up or overwhelmed of the information. So even if when we started out, we didn't have internet or having a laptop working online, having so many resources. And nowadays, the new translators coming out from universities, graduates, they tell me like, I'm overwhelmed with information. I don't know where to look for and I don't know if those are reliable. So they are surprised when they get a reliable, I don't know, source or a video or a training that's for free. Um, so we've, I think we've reached the opposite. I don't know. Uh, I think some of the free content and the free content here, for example, is very useful. I think it's very important to spread free content. Yeah. Uh, I don't do it just here. I do it in other places as well. I think that it's very, very uh, relevant to provide good information because most people get a lot of bullshit. Exactly. And they are told they have to know at least 100 million things and have to study another five years to wade through everything. You don't want that because you have to just start. Start and you'll make mistakes. But from every single mistake, you'll be learning. And some mistakes you can avoid by listening to people and otherwise you make them. The first time you get burnt and the company didn't wasn't as reliable and doesn't pay you, next time you will ask more questions. Yeah. And it's okay to learn. Everything so, is learning. Use your brain, as you mentioned already. Use your oh, brain. Yes. Thank you. Google is not the god, okay? And context is everything. If we can take three uh, sentences of today with us. Thank you, Kenneth, uh, Elena, Ileana, all of you, Dorota, that you were here with us live. Ellen, thank you so much once again. We hope to see you soon again in another live with a different topic. In the meantime, see you all of you in the bye -bye. Translators group. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ellen. Bye-bye.